thank you very much, Francisca. Um, at the end of the libation bearers, which is the middle play in the Oresteia, the chorus summarizes the horrifying history of crimes that stains the house of Atreus and asks, where is the end? Where shall the fury of fate be stilled to sleep, be done with? Um, that is really the question of my talk. It's the question in some form, which has raised by all forms of justice that are based on revenge and reciprocity. So a life for a life, a wrong for a wrong. Um, but it's not the case in all forms of vengeance that it goes on forever. So there are tit for tat strategies in game theory, which work because the game has rules which specifies how to end the game. And even the lex talionis of ancient Babylonian and Roman law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, draws a line under the entire affair after one round of retribution. What's particularly awful about the crimes that plague the house of Atreus is that there doesn't seem to be any end. There are no rules to dictate how to end this cycle. This is the awfulness of endlessness. I think it's worth pausing to recall just how awful the ancient Greeks thought endlessness was. Um, whereas Dante, apparently, now that I've heard this wonderful quotation from Grotius, um, in the spirit of the Hebrew God, whereas Dante dwells on the exquisite torments of the sinners who are condemned to hell, Greek accounts emphasize the repetitive futility of the punishments meted out to the most notorious miscreants in Hades. So there's Sisyphus endlessly and pointlessly rolling his stone uphill. There is Tantalus endlessly and vainly trying to slake his hunger and quench his thirst. There's Ixion endlessly rotating on a wheel going nowhere fast. Um, the punishments of Hades, even when they do not inflict pain, mimic this nightmarish sense of running very, very fast and getting nowhere, of repeating the same gestures over and over again, but accomplishing nothing. And to put it very anachronistically, it seems as if the house of Atreus is trapped in a kind of murderous repetition compulsion, kin killed for kin, and on and on and on. And I'd like to argue two theses, both of which are quite speculative. Um, first, that the reason the house of Atreus cannot escape the cycle of violence is because the crimes are of a very special sort. They're crimes by kin against kin. Now, just who is kin and how close kin will be the topic of some of the arguments in the trial of, of Orestes. Um, but the key point here is that these are not just any murders, um, and the Furies are very explicit about this. They say it's their special task to hound those who kill blood relatives. Um, and it's also not the only intrafamilial conflict playing out in the humanities. Um, there is the clash of two different systems of justice, one based on revenge and the other on persuasion, but it's also playing out between the older generation of the gods who are represented by the Furies and the younger one represented by Apollo and Athena. So that's my first argument. That there's something really special about these crimes. And my second argument is that these two family conflicts, both the mortals and the immortals, can only be removed, can be solved by removing them from the family. And in particular, for, from family codes of honor. And it takes outsiders, in this case, the Athenians, as Glenn's already mentioned, um, who are following explicit procedures to decide the matter once and for all. I'm not going to be arguing that these procedures are fair. I think they are in fact very unfair. 
I'm only going to be arguing that they work. And my question is, why do they work? Why should all the parties to the conflict, Orestes, the Furies, the gods, agree to allow these particularly heinous crimes to be settled by this very artificial form of justice that Athena institutes? Can the endlessness be ended? And if so, how? So let me start with an explanation of what I mean by unnatural crimes. And I should say at the outset, this is um, somewhat anachronistically applied to ancient Greece. To my knowledge, there is no ancient Greek category that corresponds precisely to the Roman and later Christian category of crimes against nature, which uh, embrace the murder of close family members, incest, and any deviation from reproductive sexuality, in short, um, any acts that might endanger the family as both a social and a reproductive unit. However, there's ample evidence that the ancient Greeks thought that at least incest, incest and murders of family members were abominations. Plato considered incest so vile that there was no point in having laws against it. And the revelation that Oedipus has inadvertently killed his father and slept with his mother, Jocasta, dooms both of them and blights the land that they rule in which crops wither and children die. Um, Plutarch remarks that whereas Roman historians thought insubordinate women were so noteworthy, so deviant as to be recorded in history, the Greek historians recorded the names of those who first murdered kinfolk with a particular frisson of horror. So all murders are obviously heinous crimes. And for the ancient Greeks, they're also polluting if they shed blood. But the murders of close family members were in a different category altogether. Hunting those who commit such crimes against blood relatives, and this is all about blood, along with those who violate the duties that bind host and guest is the special province of the Furies. And because of the central role that blood plays in the vengeance of the Furies, both in defining the deeds they punish and also the way in which they hunt their quarry, we might call these blood crimes. Um, the House of Atreus is surely exhibit A for blood crimes. I'm not going to rehearse the litany starting with Tantalus. Kerry gave us something of a capsule summary last night um, in his inter introduction. Um, I simply want to underscore that there is a particular sense in which these crimes against close family members are felt to be exceptionally horrific and therefore to demand exceptionally brutal vengeance. Um, they're not only crimes that shed blood, they are crimes against blood. And the entire Oresteia is blood spattered. So Cassandra, when she first arrives in Argos in the Agamemnon, um, describes the house of Atreus um, as a house that God hates, guilty within of kindred blood shed, the dripping floor. Clytemnestra, we've already heard this several times, exults that dying Agamemnon spattered me with the dark red and violent driven rain of bitter savored blood. The chorus of the enslaved women who accompany Electra to the grave of Agamemnon um, lament that the glut of blood drunk by our fostering ground the vengeful gore is caked and hard, will not drain through. And after slaying Clytemnestra, his own mother, um, Orestes says he will seek out Apollo's sanctuary to escape this blood that is my own. Uh, the Furies, of course, are the bloodiest of all. Blood drips from their eyes. They trail their quarry by the splash and drip of blood. They are literally bloodthirsty. They warn Orestes that his mother's blood spilled on the ground must be repaid with the red blood of your body to suck. To shed the blood of a family member, one's own blood, as Orestes says, is particularly horrendous because it is blood ties that create the family. 
The Furies do not pursue just any old murderer, however depraved. When Apollo asks why they did not torment Clytemnestra after she killed Agamemnon, the Furies explain, such murder would not be the slaying of kindred blood. Murders committed by those outside the family could also be prosecuted outside the family. Um, and indeed, the Athenian Areopagus, the court that Athena establishes in the Eumenides, allowed only the victim's family members to bring murder charges against the alleged perpetrator. It was the family whose honor had been besmirched by the crime, and it was the family's right and indeed duty to plead for public redress for the dishonor. But what to do if the bloodshed occurs within the family? The dishonor of murdering a parent or child is to ordinary murders what incest is to sex crimes, violence compounded by deepest betrayal of trust. Clytemnestra and Aegisthus claim they are avenging the blood of slaughtered children betrayed by father Agamemnon and um, also by Atreus, um, um, respectively. Orestes and Electra are incensed by how Clytemnestra has dishonored their father by murdering him in his bath. They say it would have been all right if he had died with honor by the wa walls of Troy, but it's this dishonor which is insupportable. And Clytemnestra spurs on the drowsy furies by ranting about how she is dishonored among the dead as an unavenged victim of matricide. So blood has not only been spilled, it has been dishonored. And because the family members are the perpetrators, the family members also have to be the avengers. And the cycle of revenge goes on for as long as there are offended family members to begin the next round of, of violence, generation after generation. So what happens in the family stays in the family. Um, Orestes and Electra have not produced another generation of the house of Atreus. And so the Furies take over to enforce this ideal of justice. They say, it is but law that when the red drops have been spilled upon the ground, they cry aloud for fresh blood. For the death act calls out on fury to bring up from those who were slain before new ruin on ruin accomplished. So we are back to the awfulness of endlessness and how to break the cycle. So the house of Atreus is not the only dreadful family having it out with itself in the Oresteia. Throughout the Eumenides, the older generation of gods represented by the Furies clash with the younger gods, Apollo and Athena. And even though Apollo keeps abuse on the Furies and Athena at first doesn't even recognize who they are, they too are kin and they too belong to a family absolutely notorious for internecine violence and eating their young. I can't go into the gory details here, suffice it to say there's more blood, lots of it, and cannibalism, except to point out that according to Hesiod's Theogony, the Furies are born from the drops of blood that fall on the earth when Kronos, who is Zeus's father, castrates his father, Uranus, the sky god, making Athena and Apollo, who are the children of Zeus, the grandniece and nephew of the Furies. These younger gods apparently regard their fearsome great aunts, the Furies, with all the fear and loathing with which Bertie Wooster regards his formidable Aunt Agatha. Aeschylus's alternative genealogy for the Furies, making them daughters of Nyx, the knight, places them in an even more ancient and powerful lineage, as we learn from uh, Book 14 of the Iliad. Even Zeus, Lord of the Thunderbolts, is afraid of Nyx, which makes me wonder just how potent Athena's threat that she knows where the Thunderbolts are kept is for the Furies. Like Clytemnestra, the Furies complain repeatedly that they too have been dishonored 
by the younger generation who are themselves soaked in blood, according to the Furies. So there are two family bloodlines seeking vengeance for besmirched honor in the humanities. Whatever solution is found is going to have to work for both of these strife-torn families. Um, the trial Athena sets up to try the case of Orestes is on the face of it a travesty of justice. Glenn has already shown um, with great lucidity and force all the problems um, with this trial. Um, neither prosecution nor defense even pretends um, to be neutral. Apollo is a confessed accomplice to Orestes' crime of matricide. Um, and Athena, um, who doesn't deign to pursue either of Apollo's doomed lines of a defense, um, declaring herself the product of a masculine birth, is lying through her teeth. She does have a mother, Metis, um, whom Zeus swallows, another case of family cannibalism, um, in order to prevent the next generation from dethroning him as he dethroned his father, Kronos. And to top it all off, if this weren't enough to declare a mistrial, the Furies threaten the jury by vowing to devastate their land if they vote to acquit. So by the time um, the jurors are asked to cast their votes, what began as a murder trial has degenerated into a match between the girls team, the Furies representing Clytemnestra, versus the boys team, Apollo and Athena representing Orestes. Um, it is mysterious how justice can emerge from such shambolic and obviously corrupt proceedings. And astonishingly, it must be said, given the fact that the jury has been handpicked by Athena from only the male citizens of the city that owes her fealty. Remember, this has been set up as a male versus female battle. Um, the jury delivers a hung verdict. And as Glenn has already said, a great deal of scholarly ink has been spilled over whether Athena's own vote in favor of Orestes creates the tie or breaks it. But for me, the real point is she only has one vote. And however one interprets the final tally, at least half of the jurors have voted against Orestes and against Athena, who has made her own views quite clear in this matter. Moreover, um, all of the parties have agreed beforehand to abide by the decision of a third party. Not only Apollo and Orestes, but also the Furies ask Athena to adjudicate. And then the goddess turns over the authority to mortal jurors. So even though she's invented this entire procedure out of whole cloth, Athena agrees to be bound by her own rules and to recognize the independence of the jurors, at least half of whom have sided against her. It's a striking reversal of the deus ex machina solution to a tragic conundrum. So the older goddesses first cede their authority to the younger one, who then cedes her authority to mere mortals. So in order for vengeance of the endless sort to at least um, give way to um, vengeance of a finite sort, the immortals have to give way to the mortals. A hung jury by the rules of the Areopagus means acquittal and Orestes and Apollo are obviously very happy with this outcome. But the Furies are furious. Um, their definition is substantive, not procedural. It's not enough that the rules have been followed. The murderers must be punished. And Orestes is a self-confessed matricide. And once again, they accuse the younger generation of gods of mocking old laws and dishonoring their enforcers. Um, the chorus says, I have borne what cannot be borne, great the sorrows and the dishonor upon the daughters of night. Yet the Furies do not go so far as to resume their pursuit of Orestes. They thus tacitly accept the jury's verdict. Instead, they threaten to poison the jury's land of Athens. Now, at, this is the point at which the action of the play pivots. 
the Furies are no longer avenging Clytemnestra against Orestes. That's been settled. They are avenging their own dishonor. However flawed, Athena's procedural justice has succeeded in ending the murder of kin by kin in the family of Atreus. And the question is, can she pull off the same trick with her family, that is the family of the gods? And once again, it's procedures by mortals that must somehow put an end to this strife. And the procedures in this case are rituals of devotion offered by the Athenians. So there are torchlight processionals, there are offerings, there are regal purple robes, there are shining thrones in a subterranean shrine. Um, Athena entices the Furies with what they crave most, honor and dignity and also power. No household shall be prosperous without your will, promises Athena. And the Furies are won over. They say, I think you will have your way with me. My hate is going. The Furies become the kindly ones. So what does it take for hate to go? What does it take to end the civil war that drinks the black blood of citizens through passion for revenge and bloodshed for bloodshed? Athena certainly has not persuaded the Furies by argument or evidence. Nor does she bully and revile the older goddesses as Apollo does. The closest she comes to such tactics is her menacing remark about knowing where the keys to Zeus's thunderbolts are kept. But I interpret this, I don't interpret this, frankly, as a threat. I think reading it in light of Iliad 14, um, uh, Zeus himself is afraid of their mother. He's not going to come after them with the thunderbolts. It's rather an attempt to get them to the Furies to stop their angry fulminations long enough to listen to her, um, rather than trying to settle the matter through a show of irresistible force. So instead, what Athena does is to balance dishonor shown the Furies by the younger gods with honors to be shown them by mortals, by the Athenians. As in the case of the settlement represented by the trial of Orestes, one can ask whether the Furies have again gotten a raw deal. Um, they're trading in their short hitons of huntresses for those purple roads, which I think it's hard not to read this as an echo of the regal robes with which Clytemnestra ensnares Agamemnon. Um, their fleet footed pursuit of murderers has been traded for sitting around on those shiny chairs. Um, they've allowed themselves to become domesticated. They become literally household gods. One wonders what the ghost of Clytemnestra, like Athena and indeed the Furies, a female who refused to be confined to the conventional female role, thought of it all. She remains unavenged and still dishonored at the play's end. But as in the case of the trial, whether this particular outcome is just or fair is really beside the point. The real point is that rules of the game have been established to end the cycle of violence and dishonor within the family. Whether they govern the proceedings of the Areopagus or the ritual devotion paid to the Furies, these rules do not derive their legitimacy from any single observance. Rather, it is Athena's guarantee that the people of Aegeus will forever more hold murder trials on the hill of Ares, and that the Furies will receive such honor for the rest of time that gives both of these settlements their legitimacy. We might say that she thereby institutionalizes both settlements, but that's just a fancy way of saying that she converts single case rules into repetitive ones that are binding on all parties, no matter how circumstances may change in time. So she's not promising justice in the individual case. She's only promising fairness, everyone treated alike in the aggregate. These rules come what may will hold not only for the Athenians, but also for the gods for the rest of time. My last comment is just to underscore how remarkable this artificial solution to the endless blood crimes of 
the families of both the mortals and immortals is. It reverses the direction of time. Most institutions legitimize themselves by appeals to the deep past. We have always done things this way since time immemorial. Just as Athena transfers justice from gods to humans, she transfers the legitimation of the new rules of justice from the deep past to the deep future. Paradoxically, the awfulness of endlessness ends only when it is replaced with the endlessness of processes and processions for the rest of time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this very enlightening talk, uh, Lorraine. And I see we have a first question from Eva Iluz. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Lorraine, for this wonderful talk, which resonated very much with uh, Gens and Stevens. Um, I, I was wondering, a uh, very simple question, what you made out of the fact that um, in the Bible, the first crime is a crime committed in the family? And more generally, of the Freudian account of the birth of civilization as being located in the murder of the father in uh, Totem and Taboo. And uh, what I find particularly interesting in the, this kind of Freudian myth is this idea that maybe one of the reasons why the first murder is a murder inside the family is because we have uh, so much conflicted feeling towards the family. So that would be in a way, almost the natural way of that murder would um, be born. And what I find particularly interesting in Freud is that, and this is why his account is so interesting, is that for him, it's the birth of civilization because that first murder is also the emergence of guilt. And he even says, I don't remember exactly, exactly how he puts it, but that guilt gives rise, um, you know, that the conflict is present in the people who judge the crime as well, or the desire for murder or the conflict is pre present in the people who judge the crime as well as among those who commit the crime. And therefore, this is the birth of the penal system. So it, what is interesting here, I think, is that in a way we have a similar way to account for the birth of justice, for the birth of the penal system as being located in the family, only that Freud, I think, has a much more uh, ambivalent way to look at it as, as, as being also, uh, because it is in the family, uh, we, we can have guilt, and therefore we can have laws. Yeah, that's fascinating, Eva. Um, so, I mean, the flat-footed answer to your question about Cain and Abel, of course, would be there's not many people around to kill um, at that <laughs> point, but they're only members of the family, but that's a very flat-footed answer. I think what's really interesting is the displacement here. Um, after all, Cain and Abel are vying for the attentions and the preference, not of Adam and Eve, their parents, but of God, the father, as it were. So there's been a kind of um, displacement of the paternal role um, to where it's going to stay, frankly, for a very long time. Um, and it says something I think very interesting about the origins of religion, that it too is being cast in this, this family mold. And I think, I mean, this is now um, reading Milton, back into the Hebrew Bible, which one probably as a historian shouldn't do, but I'll do it anyway, since we're entre nous, um, which is that um, Milton understands that since God has foreseen all of these things, at least in his theology, just as you say, God who is judging Cain and Abel um, is guilty. And this is his fault in some way. He knew this was all going to happen, and yet somehow sets this chain of events going. So I, I think, as always, Freud was unbelievably um, perspicacious in this. Um, with 
with regard to the um, totem and taboo argument, which is of course exactly the argument about um, um, Cronus uh, castrating Uranus, um, Zeus imprisoning Cronus, Zeus then trying to eat up all of um, not just his children, but the mothers of his children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is sort of the problem of succession of generations. And um, it, what's really interesting about these tales of succession, I don't think Freud does comment on this. These are all stories of male, um, male um, conflicts with succession. And one of the real puzzles in the Oristaya is Clytemnestra and Electra hate each other's guts. Um, Electra has every opportunity, if she really feels that her mother deserves to die for killing her father, to wreak revenge. And certainly Clytemnestra, who knows that Electra is a viper in the nest, has every opportunity to kill Electra. It does not happen. Um, and perhaps Glenn can help us out here. I don't know of a single case of a mother in Greek tragedy killing a daughter. Medea kills her two sons in order to revenge herself on Jason, but there seem to be certain configurations of this kind of intrafamilial violence which are possible and others which are not. Um, this is a puzzle for the structuralist. Okay, since, okay, I don't know, Wendy Donica, is it directly at this point? I was just going to say that as a structuralist, my paper will indeed address that puzzle. Okay. Okay, so stay tuned. Thank you. Okay. 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 So uh, you mentioned Glenn Most, who is the next in line anyway, so. Yeah. Uh, Rainey, that was wonderful. Um, you and I will need to discuss Athena's reference to the lightning bolts of Zeus but we can do that in another place and another time. As far as mothers who kill their daughters, I don't think that um, even if no, no examples occur to me, I don't think that anybody can exclude anything from Greek mythology. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some version of some myth in which that happens. But I wanted to ask you something else. I found extremely en enlightening your emphasis upon honor with regard to vengeance. Um, in a sense, it's, it's quite easy to see why honor should be so central, because if somebody does something to me and thinks he can get away with it, he is dishonoring me because he thinks that I'm not capable of, of doing to him what he's done to me. So you can see how notions of honor and of being dishonored are a fundamental mechanism in retribution. What I wanna ask you is, do you think it could be, honor can be excluded altogether from justice and from the city? because one can suggest that what is being dishonored in a crime, especially if it goes unpunished, is not so much the victim of the crime as rather the whole city, um, the whole state in which that kind of act doesn't get punished and in which the moral value of the totality is put into question. No, that's a really interesting question. So in a sense, what, one way of reframing the question is to say that um, just as what is happening in the humanities is the transfer of an internal family conflict um, to outsiders, um, you're transferring the honor, which is after all, first and foremost, a family value um, to the polis as a whole. And I suppose, I would have another question for you, or perhaps for Stephen, um, still thinking about those um, victim impact statements, um, which is, what does it mean um, when, um, hi, Angela, um, what does it mean when um, the, um, maybe I should wait for Glenn to get back so he can get the answer to his own question, so. Sorry, Glenn. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so the question is for, for you and, and perhaps also for Stephen is, um, what does it mean if you take honor completely out of the system? So it's one thing just to, to rechannel it and to say, from now on, it's going to be the honor of the entire city of Athens 
whether or not a murderer gets punished or not, um, and not just a, a family matter. Um, but what happens if you say, we're no longer going to talk about honor, we're going to talk about suffering? I mean, I think Nietzsche would have something to say about this, so. Uh, next one is uh, David Schulman. Um, first of all, thank you, Rainy, for the beautiful paper. I just have a couple of very short um, comments, perhaps more than questions. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that the crimes involved in these three plays are not just any crimes. They're highly specific to the family of Atreus. And I don't think it's only because kin are involved, it's because these crimes, um, one after another, generation after generation, endanger the very existence of the family line. In fact, by the time you get to the, uh, you know, the point uh, at the end of the humanities, it's a miracle that there's anybody left alive at all in the, uh, in the <laughs> family of Atreus. It's as if there were a kind of a tremendous um, uh, anxiety about the mere survivability of a family and that that is the thing that is at stake in all of these uh, endless, um, you know, murders within the family, murders, cannibalism, the whole thing. You have to look at the whole um, generational structure. Um, it also speaks to the question of time with which you ended because um, if the survivability of the family line is what's at stake, then that means their future itself is at stake. There is no future, in fact. And you could even say that the temporal scheme here is more complex than that because a matricide, I mean, matricide, just think about it, it's a kind of retrospective way of um, uh, your own birth. Right, I mean, the way of, of wiping yourself out um, retroactively, so to speak. Um, so, in that sense, I think that the um, issue at the end of the humanities is really very much, as you have put it, that is to say, allowing for some rather precarious, tenuous form of future to exist at all. Then the other thing is that I think by now um, we can probably all agree that the court scene at the end of the humanities is not exactly an idealized picture of a beautifully um, working system. It's somewhere closer to a travesty of that. Um, makes me wonder if we should think of it, or if the Greeks thought of it, not as a routinized, uh, regularized, almost bureaucratized set of hard and fast rules, but to use your term, you said the rules of the game are such and such. Perhaps we would do better to think of it as a kind of game and not just any game. It's a game which is probably set up in such a way that uh, the chances that you'd have a neutral or fair outcome are not very high. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, David. And, and I can't help but think in the way that you frame this, and perhaps this is also at the back of your mind, that um, there's an analogy between the kind of demographic panic which now grips certain polities. Um, uh, Israel is of course the prime example, the concern that your particular extended family is not going to continue somehow. Um, but also there are many societies which have very strong pro-natalist policies. Um, Germany is another one um, because of this fear that there isn't going to be a future. Now, of course, there, there's going to be a future for humanity. It's just that there's not going to be a future for this family. So it's very much implicitly framed, again, at least by analogy, in terms of a family um, going on. And you're absolutely right about um, the way in which I decided to shift this analogy to rules of a game, because I think that Aeschylus must have realized that the arguments are horrendous in uh, I mean, Apollo, Apollo has one really rotten argument after another. As Glenn said, no one could believe these arguments. Um, and he, he abandons his own arguments. He has this whole song and dance when the Furies say, well, we don't pursue um, um, Clytemnestra because she didn't kill close kin. He says, oh, but you know, the wife is the closest kin, the sacral marriage bonds, this from the man who seduced um, Cassandra. Um, and he just drops it like a hot potato because it's going nowhere, this argument. And I wonder whether this whole travesty 
to which you draw attention, to which Glenn drew attention, is really to show it's not about the content at all. Mm -hmm. It is about, as I say, the repeatability of these rules. It's a procedural form of justice. The one last thought I have, though, about immortality is the gods. So the gods, in a sense, are cursed by immortality. So they, they cannot, um, what is it, the story of Tithonus, um, the mortal who marries the goddess of the dawn and is given immortality without eternal youth. Um, there's, there's a mor moral there also for the gods themselves. And they are cursed with a, an infinite future. And for them, the real puzzle is how to somehow structure that infinite future. They're always going to be by their very nature gods, but how are they going to coexist with one another? So it, even if you have a guaranteed future as the immortals by definition do, you still can't escape the conundrum of figuring out and how do we go on? Susan. Ah, nein, keine Frage? I, I pass. I, there are too many other people. Okay. Um, then uh, Peter Gallison. Uh, yes, so wonderful, uh, Rainey. Um, I, you know, we've focused largely in the discussion so far on the distinction between the Furies and the principles of Apollo and Athena. And I wondered if there were ways, there were distinctions between or conflicts or complementarities between the principles of Apollo and Athena that themselves create a kind of um, alternate opposite of the of the of the blood logic of the Furies. Yeah. Um, so as I say, it's really interesting to me how Athena ignores pointedly all of the stupid arguments of Apollo. So uh, she, she does not take up either his argument that husband and wife are closer than um, father and daughter. Um, he, uh, she does not take up his stupid argument that um, only the father is um, the, um, the, the, the parent um, and therefore that the mother has no share. So in a sense, Athena, I mean, if I were to um, colloquialize this, I'd say she's got this really rather twerpy kid brother um, who really um, has to be reined in if this is going to work to create some kind of um, fragile peace within the family. Um, the reactions, for example, Apollo insults the Furies. Um, he reviles them. Athena says, I'm not quite sure. Could you remind me of your names? I'm sure we've met someplace before. Um, um, and um, then, of course, pours on the flattery um, and, and the gift. So there's definitely a tension between the tactics of Athena and Apollo. And it's really interesting. I still don't have an explanation for this. I don't understand why Apollo hands over the responsibility for adjudicating this conflict to Athena. Um, he clearly realizes perhaps that he's outclassed, but it is, I think, a much more crucial moment then perhaps one realizes at first reading of the humanities that there's within this brother-sister pair um, a certain amount of conflict going on. There, there is something about, you know, I mean, sometimes people speak, and certainly it was true for Nietzsche and the tradition that follows of the Apollonian as being somehow the, the reasoned, you know, identifying it with reason, but Reason, in some ways, seems to me to be partitioned among between uh, Athena and Apollo in different ways. I mean, I, I think there are arguments that Athena dismantles of Apollo, but there seems to me a way in which we might productively think about the limits of reason or the range of reason as it distributes 
between them, different mm. forms of reasoning. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, what's really interesting, I, I see your point, and at least Apollo, however specious his arguments might be in terms of their content, they are arguments. He frames them as arguments. Um, whereas Athena simply um, at the end um, announces that she personally, because of her own history, her own biography, um, she personally has certain views. That's not an argument. That is simply an attestation of bias. So I think you are right to say that there is, to some extent, an apportionment. I mean, she is, after all, you know, also embodies, or symbolizes, or you know, incorporates the the military, right? The the defensive shield, and there's a way in which um, identifying the tactics, often brilliant, that she deploys across mythology of the military and the shield and the helm and so on, uh, it is nonetheless not in the capacity of reason incarnate. It's something else and uh, maybe embodied in the world reason versus some kind of Ap Apollonian grasp for a reason that's less embodied. I, I, I don't know, but I'm just, yeah. my, my ambition or my hope is that we might be able to think of this the two of them together incorporating something that is the opposite of the older blood logic. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have uh, two more questions and um, looking at the timetable, I would ask for a point of questions and pointed answers. Next one is Kerry Harrison. Well, thank you. I'm, I only have, um, like David, a, a comment rather than a question um, and I'll be over very swiftly. What a wonderful, talk, Rainey, thank you. That was an absolute joy. I just wanted to say that on behalf of the literature of my native land, I never expected uh, Bertie's Aunt Agatha to find her way into our proceedings. I was so thrilled to hear her name. And I just want to say in passing, Woodhouse, it's not well known. Woodhouse was a classicist himself, educated at Dulwich College, there are many classical references in his books. Uh, people don't generally know that, but he would be so thrilled by your invoking Aunt Agatha as a fury. It's just a wonderful idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have one last question from uh, the audience from Froma Zeitlin. Um, Apollo's argument is built on a technicality to resolve the implacable argument of the Irenaeus. How would you look at this in light of the revolution of the merchant of Venice, which is most closely, which it most closely resembles? Sorry, Francisco, could you just repeat that last sentence? Of yes. um, you can also you can also read along and the question, but I'll repeat it. Um, how would you look at this in light of the resolution of the merchant of Venice, which it most closely resembles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, thank you, Froma. Um, that's a really interesting. I've never, I, of course, I've always thought, in part because of you, I've always thought of these two, this play in connection with Hamlet, not with um, the, the Merchant of Venice. Um, it, I guess when I think about the Merchant of Venice, in a sense, Portia's arguments, which are the arguments of sweet reason, fail. Um, and in the end, Antonio has got off on a technicality. And I guess I see the point of the analogy, which is that the hung jury, however we decide to count um, how we get to the hung jury with Athena's vote, the hung jury is getting Orestes off on a technicality, just as in the end, um, um, the case is won, not by Portia's arguments or anybody's arguments, but on a technicality. Thank you. Um, 